Considering that we now know how to create schemas and maps, we've reached a point where we can start creating actual integration solutions. In order to take that next step, we will need to be able to deploy our artifacts out to the BizTalk runtime. So in this module, we're going to take a look at the process that's required to deploy a BizTalk application. And then once the application is up and running, we'll need some knowledge of what it takes to manage that application. The BizTalk runtime is very flexible and highly configurable. And it gives you quite a few options to alter the configuration of an application as you migrate it from one environment to another. So let's get started. In the first part of this module, we're going to walk through the process of deploying a set of components that make up a BizTalk application. We'll talk about what happens during that deployment and also look at the tools that are available to us to make those deployments happen. After that, we're going to look into a few of the management tasks that we might need to perform when working with our applications. In particular, we're going to talk about how we can export our applications, move those to another environment, and import them. We're also going to spend a few minutes talking about the BizTalk hosting model. And that's really important to understand because that's the primary means available to us to scale out our applications after deployment. In this first lesson, we're going to take a behind the scenes look at the BizTalk deployment process. After that, we'll talk about what a BizTalk application actually consists of. And that's important because it's tempting to think of a BizTalk application as an instance of the BizTalk service. And that actually isn't the case. Once we have a sense of how BizTalk deployment works and what makes up a BizTalk application, I'll walk you through the sequence of steps that's required to actually deploy an application. We need to talk about this idea of strong names that will be applied to our assemblies. And then I'll show you how to configure the deployment properties for your BizTalk solution in Visual Studio. Visual Studio is just one of the tools available to you to assist with deployment. So we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about the other tools that are available to you as well. And then finally, at the end of this lesson, I'll walk through a demo so that you can see how to apply these configuration settings to your BizTalk solution and then deploy it. We've talked about the fact that BizTalk is built on a publish subscribe architecture. And now that we're ready to start deploying application components, we need to think about the implications of that architecture a little further. One of the characteristics of a publish subscribe architecture is that it makes very few assumptions about where application components actually reside. As long as a component can publish messages or subscribe to messages and receive them, they can become part of an application. And that's a very good thing because it provides the ability to scale out an application, adding new hardware as the application demands it. And it makes failover possible. When our components are running on multiple servers, if one goes down, another one can take over. Now looking from the perspective of managing a distributed application, a publish-subscribe architecture poses a few challenges. Amongst those challenges, we need to be able to determine which components have been deployed to a set of servers. BizTalk handles that by registering deployed components in a database. That database is known as the BizTalk Management Database. But you might also hear it referred to as the Configuration Database. When you deploy an assembly that contains BizTalk artifacts, you will need to use one of the BizTalk deployment tools to register that assembly with the BizTalk management database. The BizTalk deployment tools know how to examine an assembly and identify any BizTalk artifacts that it contains. So whether those are schemas, maps, pipelines, or orchestrations, the deployment tool will find those and register those with the management database. Once the BizTalk artifacts are registered, that assembly will need to be installed in the GAC of each server in the BizTalk group that needs to make use of it. Now, if your application includes assemblies that do not contain BizTalk artifacts, those assemblies do not need to be registered with the management database. Those assemblies simply need to be installed in the GAC of each server that will be using them. As you start deploying assemblies out to your BizTalk environment, and as the number of deployed assemblies starts growing, 
you may find that it becomes more and more of a challenge to manage all of those components. Well, this talk gives you a way to organize your components. It allows you to organize your components into groups. And those groups of components are called BizTalk applications. Now, there are actually no hard and fast rules that specify which components should be included in a given application. So it's actually left up to you or someone within your organization, it might be a system administrator, to decide how your components should be grouped into BizTalk applications. It's perfectly legitimate, by the way, for components in one application to interact with components in another application. And it's also possible to define dependencies between applications. So you might deploy a set of common components to an application, and then you could have many other BizTalk applications that all make reference to that common BizTalk application. In the end, you'll probably find yourself thinking in terms of maintenance and administration tasks when you try to decide how to group your components. It probably makes sense to group components together if they need to be enabled or disabled as a unit. It often makes sense to group all of the components that are part of a Visual Studio solution into the same BizTalk application. And it usually makes sense to group components that need to be versioned together. A little later on, I'm going to show you how you can export all of the components from a given application. And then you can take those components and import them into a BizTalk application in another BizTalk environment. One thing, by the way, that a BizTalk application does not define is where its components reside and where they will execute. There is another collection of settings that allow you to configure those options. And we're going to talk about that at the end of this module. In short then, BizTalk applications simply provide a means to organize the components that have been deployed to our BizTalk environment. When you reach the point in your development cycle, at which you're ready to deploy your components out to the BizTalk runtime environment, there's a sequence of steps that you'll need to follow to complete that deployment. Those steps are listed here. You can get started by configuring a set of properties on your BizTalk projects in Visual Studio. BizTalk requires your application assemblies to be deployed to the GAC. And for that reason, you will need to configure each of your BizTalk projects to be digitally signed. I'll talk more about that point in just a minute. The next thing that you need to configure on each of your BizTalk projects is a set of deployment properties. You'll need to provide the information that Visual Studio needs to know to register each assembly in a BizTalk management database. Once you have those settings configured, you're ready to build your assemblies. And once you have the assemblies built, you can ask Visual Studio to deploy them to the BizTalk runtime. At that point, Visual Studio will register each component with the BizTalk management database that you've specified, and it can also install the assembly in the GAC. Once that's complete, you can go create the ports that are required for your application. And after that, you can start your application, enabling and starting the ports, and listing and starting the orchestrations. In the first step of that deployment sequence, you saw that each of your assemblies must be assigned a strong name. This requirement actually originates in the .NET runtime. Any assembly that is going to be deployed to the global assembly cache needs to be assigned a strong name. And in order to have a strong name, an assembly must be digitally signed. And in order to be digitally signed, the assembly's project needs to be configured with an encryption key. So what you need to do to make that happen is visit the BizTalk Projects properties and go to the Signing tab, and then check the box labeled Sign the Assembly, and then you can choose a file that contains the encryption key that you want to use. So that digital signature provides a couple of benefits. First, it's possible to detect if a digitally signed assembly has been altered, and so it provides a way to verify the integrity of an assembly. The strong name also includes a unique string that is derived from your encryption key. And that allows you to create uniquely named assemblies. If there is an assembly with an identical name in every other respect, but it has been signed with a different key, then the unique string derived from that key file 
will distinguish the unique string derived from your key file. That unique string I'm talking about, by the way, is called the public key token. One last point is that a strong name includes a version number. And because of that, you can deploy multiple versions of the same assembly to the GAC. Older applications can use the older version and newer applications can use the newer versions. And so, again, all of that originates in the .NET framework. And since the components that you build for BizTalk are in fact .NET components, you'll just need to be aware of strong names and how to apply them to your assemblies. The second step listed in the deployment sequence is to configure the deployment properties on each of our BizTalk projects. So to do that, you'll need to visit the properties window for each project and then click on the deployment tab and you'll see the property grid shown here. So you'll need to provide the information that Visual Studio will need to connect to the BizTalk management database. In this case, the BizTalk management database is on the local machine. Now, if you notice the property at the top, which is called application name, that property allows you to assign this assembly to a BizTalk application. If that BizTalk application does not already exist, it will be created when this assembly is deployed. You can also see a property named redeploy. If you set that to true, when Visual Studio deploys this assembly, but it finds that this assembly already exists in the BizTalk runtime, it will attempt to query the BizTalk management database for any configuration settings that are associated with this assembly. These settings could include, for example, the send and receive ports that are associated with an orchestration. It will retain a copy of those settings, then remove the existing assembly from the BizTalk runtime, deploy your new assembly, and then restore those configuration settings back to the BizTalk management database. If you set the redeploy property to false, you'll need to perform the equivalent of that process by some other means. You can see a couple of other options that are related to deployments to your local machine. So you can indicate if you want Visual Studio to automatically install your assembly in the global assembly cache. And you can also specify whether or not you want Visual Studio to automatically restart any host instances. And that could be useful during development when you need to deploy the same version of your assembly more than once. The old instance of your assembly will remain in memory until the process that has loaded it restarts. In this case, you can instruct Visual Studio to restart those host instance processes automatically. On the other hand, if your development environment is configured with many host instances, you can leave this option disabled and then select which instances you want to restart in the BizTalk administration console. There's a pretty decent chance that you'll be using Visual Studio to handle the deployments in your development environment. But once you start migrating your applications to other BizTalk environments, you will need to become familiar with the other tools that can perform deployments. There is, of course, the BizTalk Administration Console, and you'll probably have a need from time to time to use it to export and import applications, and to export and import application configuration settings, which are also known as bindings. And there is a command line equivalent as well. You might find it useful to create deployment scripts for your development environment using the command line tool. And it is almost certainly the tool that an administrator would use to deploy an application to a production environment. In this demonstration, I will show you how to assign a strong name to a BizTalk project in Visual Studio. And then I'll show you how to configure the application deployment properties. After that, I'll build the BizTalk solution and then deploy it to the runtime environment. And once that's done, I'll show you how you can see the application in the BizTalk administration console. All right, well, here we are back in the AdventureWorks solution in Visual Studio. And the initial coding is complete, so we can deploy this to our development BizTalk environment. The processes project has already been configured with a strong name and with the deployment properties.
but we need to set those properties on the messaging project before we can go any further. So the first thing to do is assign a key file to the messaging project. And I'll do that by opening the messaging project properties and visiting the signing tab. Now I need to check the box to indicate that this assembly needs to be signed. And then I'll need to provide the name of the key file that should be used for the signing. All right, while well that's set, now we need to configure the properties on the deployment page. You can see that we already have the BizTalk management database name and server name configured. So the main thing we need to do here is configure the application name for the messaging assembly. And we want that to show up under the AdventureWorks application in the BizTalk admin console. Okay, now that that's complete, we're ready to build the solution. All right, well, the build has succeeded. If we go look in the directory structure for this solution, we'll be able to find the messaging assembly that was just created. And there it is. OK, now that the build is complete, we can go ahead and deploy this application. And I'll do that by right-clicking on the solution and then selecting Deploy. OK, well, we can see that the deployment succeeded. Now let's go out to the Administration Console and see if the AdventureWork application shows up in the list. OK, the BizTalk Administration Console was already open when we deployed this application. So we need to refresh this view to get the latest data from the BizTalk Management Database. All right, there it is. Now if we go look at the resources for this application, we should be able to see the processes and the messaging assembly show up. And there's the processes and the messaging assembly. Now you can see that the assembly name consists of our project name. And then you can see some additional qualifiers that make up a strong name. So you can see the version number. You can see that the culture is neutral for this assembly. And then you can see the public key token, that unique string that was derived from our key file. Now that we know how to deploy BizTalk assemblies and applications, we need to start thinking about what it takes to manage those applications. Specifically, we need to think about what it takes to move an application from one environment to another as we progress through our testing phases. I am going to start by talking in a little more detail about the management options that are available to us through the Administration Console. One of the more common tasks that you might perform with the BizTalk Administration Console is to export or import a set of application settings, which are also known as bindings. I'll also talk about how you can export your application to an MSI package and make use of that to migrate to another environment. We'll take a quick look at the command line tool that you can use to manage applications. And then we'll spend a minute thinking about assembly versioning.
I'll show you a demonstration of these management tools. And then finally, we'll take a look at the configuration settings that you can apply to specify exactly where a component should reside and execute. We can do that by making use of BizTalk hosts and host instances. If you are going to work with BizTalk for any length of time, you will eventually become very familiar with the BizTalk administration console. When we use the BizTalk administration console to manage our applications, you could say that it is serving as a user interface for the BizTalk management database. The data that we can see about our applications is coming from the BizTalk management database, and any changes that we make to that data will be written back to the BizTalk management database. You can see in this screenshot that the admin console is displaying a list of applications that have been configured in this BizTalk group. And by right-clicking on one of the application names, you are presented with options to stop an application or to start one if it is not already running. You can access its configuration settings. You can import new components or configuration settings into an application, or you can export configuration settings and components from an application. Notice here that the BizTalk Administration Console allows you to add BizTalk assemblies directly. And that is exactly how you would deploy a new assembly using the BizTalk Administration Console. I'm going to talk in further detail about some of those other options in the upcoming slides, but just keep in mind that we can add pre- and post-processing scripts, other resources such as assemblies or other types of files. We can also add business rule policies, and we can add references to other BizTalk applications. It's tempting as a developer to focus strictly on the components that we develop in Visual Studio. And we can easily relegate the job of configuration to someone else, such as an administrator. And granted, that is probably true overall for BizTalk applications. But I do think that you'll find that the configuration settings that you create in your development environment will, in fact, turn out to play a crucial role in your development cycle. The closer that your development environment mirrors the testing and production environments in your organization, the more useful those configuration settings will be as your application is migrated from one environment to the next. So you might find it very useful to think of those configuration settings as source code. So that raises the question, well, if these settings are source code, where is the file that contains them? Fortunately, BizTalk makes it easy to export those settings to a file, and that is known as a binding file. A binding file is formatted as XML, and it contains all of the settings that are required to configure a given BizTalk application. After you've exported a binding file, it's often very useful to include that in your Visual Studio solution and add it to version control just like any of the other files in your solution. As I mentioned, if the configuration of your development environment follows the pattern of the configuration of your testing and production environments, that binding file can become very useful when you're migrating from one environment to the next. Since they are formatted as XML, you can open them in a text editor and modify those settings before you import that file into a new BizTalk group. For example, you might have paths that need to change, whether those are URLs for a web service call, or there might be a reference to a path on your local file system. In that event, you might even find it useful to maintain a copy of the binding file for each environment. And that can save you the step, after importing a binding file, of having to make manual updates to any configuration settings that might differ from one environment to the next. So, in short, treat your configuration settings as if they were source code, export them to a binding file, and version them along with the rest of the source code in your Visual Studio solution. Now it is often useful to export and import just the configuration settings in the form of binding files, but if you're going to migrate an entire application from one environment to another, you probably want to think about exporting your application to a Microsoft installer package. When you do this type of export, the resulting MSI file will contain all of your components. It will include a copy of the binding file for the application, 
It will include any business rule policies that have been assigned to this application. It will even include any non-BizTalk components that have been assigned to this application. If you recall from that screenshot of the BizTalk Administration Console, it's actually very easy to assign a non-BizTalk component to an application. You do that by choosing the Resources option on the Applications Add menu. And it's generally a good idea to add any file, whether it's an assembly or a text file or any other file, for that matter, that your application requires. Because if you do so, that file will automatically be included in the MSI package when you export your application. You might have also noticed the option to add pre- and post-processing scripts to an application. And that could be useful, for example, if you needed to create a directory structure when this application is imported into a new environment. If you use the admin console to import that package into a BizTalk group, you will see a prompt asking if you want to run the MSI package, which will launch those scripts and install your assemblies in the global assembly cache. Now, once you have used the admin console to import that MSI package via one of the servers in a BizTalk group, all of those components have now been registered in the BizTalk management database. If there are other servers in the group that will be hosting your application as well, you will need to execute this MSI package on those servers so that they have a copy of the components required for your application. You do not, however, have to re-import those components using the BizTalk administration console. Those components would already have been registered when you imported that package for the first time. So it's for that reason that you only need to copy the MSI package to the other servers and run it to complete the setup. Now you might be wondering, well, if I can import and export MSI packages, why would I ever want to simply import and export a binding file? Well, quite honestly, it can often be useful to import an MSI package to register and install all of the components for an application and then do a second import of just the binding file. And the reason for that is the point that I mentioned earlier. You might find it useful to export a binding file, update the configuration settings to match the new environment, and then use that updated binding file to configure the new environment. So however you go about that, a lot of it depends on how closely your environments mirror one another. Nonetheless, BizTalk provides some very helpful tools to help you implement your migration process. So it's nice that the BizTalk Administration Console makes it convenient to perform these types of tasks. But if you want to automate these tasks, you probably want to spend some time with the command line tool, and that is known as BTS Task. The BTS Task tool allows you to do everything that we've talked about so far. So while it might seem a little more complicated at first, it's definitely the option that you'll want to consider when you start automating migrations from one environment to the next. As with any other type of development, we need to think about versioning. So these lists give you a few things to think about as you're specking out your versioning process. It only makes sense to think about how frequently each type of component might change and organize your BizTalk projects in Visual Studio accordingly. You'll definitely want to map out the dependency tree because, for example, if you have components in assembly B that depend on components in assembly A, when assembly A is removed from the BizTalk application, the BizTalk management database will require you to remove the dependent assembly B as well. Since BizTalk relies so heavily on that message type property, which includes the XML namespace plus the root element name, you need to think carefully about how you handle versioning of schemas. At a minimum, you'll want to think about changing the target namespace, particularly when you have applications that are still using the old versions of those schemas. As far as assembly version numbers go, it's fairly common to leave the version numbers of BizTalk assemblies unchanged during the development phase. And that's a popular approach because that version number is embedded within your configuration settings. So if you update the version number for each build of a BizTalk assembly, you will need to update the configuration settings as well. 
Whether you do that by removing and deploying your assemblies via the BizTalk administration console, or you could have a script to stop your application, remove all the assemblies from it, deploy the new ones, and then import an updated binding file. Obviously, if you're going to support two different versions of the same application running simultaneously, then you'll absolutely need to update the assembly version for your BizTalk projects. In this demonstration, I will show you how to use the BizTalk administration console to import a binding file and then start the application. Then I'll show you how to stop the application and export the entire application, including all of its components, to an MSI package. Finally, I'll show you how to use the command line tool, BTS task, to remove the application. Okay, so our AdventureWorks application is deployed out to the BizTalk runtime environment. Now we have to provide some configuration settings before we can start our application. You can see here that we have no send ports defined, so our orchestration would have no ability to send a message out. So amongst other things, we need to configure our receive and send ports, and then we need to associate those with our orchestration. We could go through the steps here to create those send and receive ports, but since we have a binding file already available, it would make sense to just import the settings from there. So let's do that. We can import a binding file by right-clicking on the application icon and then choose Import and choose Bindings. Okay, there is the binding file. Okay, so the import completed successfully. You can see that we have a set of send ports now. So at this point, we have everything needed to start our application. You can see here that we can pick and choose exactly what we want to start at this point. So in our case, it makes sense to start everything. So let's go forward with that. Okay, the send ports have started. And the orchestration has started. and the receive location has started. All right. We can stop this application by right-clicking, choosing Stop. And we have some options now when we stop the application. We might want to stop processing but leave any messages associated with this application in the message box so that we can continue processing them later. On the other hand, if we do that, we won't be able to perform all of the other options that we need to do. So we'll select the full stop option. And we had not sent any messages through, but if there had been any messages associated with this application or instances of our orchestration running, those would have been terminated. So we can see that all of the components in our application have been stopped. Now I'd like to show you how to export this application to an MSI file. And we can do that once again by right-clicking on the application. And this time select Export and choose MSI file. And we'll work our way through this wizard to select exactly what we want to export and where the MSI file should be stored. 
So here's the list of components and configuration settings that we can export with this application. So let's just go ahead and export everything. If our application made use of an IIS virtual directory, that would show up here. So that would allow us to do something like export all of these settings for a web service, which will then be automatically imported and installed in our new environment. Apart from the components in the BizTalk system application, the AdventureWork application does not make use of any other components in this BizTalk environment. But you might find that you have common components that you use across many applications in your BizTalk groups. And so it might make sense to factor those out to an application of their own. And then each of your applications could simply reference that common application. You can add a reference to another application, by the way, by right clicking on your application in the tree view, selecting add, and then select Reference. So this is going to ensure that the BizTalk system application has been deployed in the new environment before the AdventureWorks application is imported. OK, now we can provide the name of the BizTalk application that we want to use in our new environment. And we can also provide the location for storing the MSI file. All right, we're ready to export. Very good. The export completed. Now that we have that MSI file that contains everything we need to recreate this application, let's go ahead and remove the AdventureWorks application from this environment. We could do that using the Administration Console, but I'll show you how you can do that using the command line tool. OK, so the command line tool is named BTS task. All right, here's the list of commands that the BTS task tool supports. So let's start off by listing the applications that are configured in our BizTalk management database. This list should match the applications that we can see in the BizTalk Administration Console. OK. And there we have it. You can see that the AdventureWorks application is included in this list. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove the AdventureWorks application. OK, well, that completed successfully. And if we re-query for the list of applications, you can see that the AdventureWorks application no longer appears. OK, well, there you have it. You've had a chance to see how to perform management tasks. You've seen how to deploy an application using Visual Studio how to import the configuration settings for it using the Administration Console, and now you've seen how to use the command line tool to remove an application. I mentioned at the beginning of this module that one of the characteristics of a published subscribe architecture is that it makes very few assumptions about where a component will be hosted and where it will execute.
as long as a component can publish messages, or it can subscribe to messages and receive them, then that component can play a role within an application. So at this point, I would like to talk about how we can specify where a component should reside and execute. And that means we need to gain an understanding of BizTalk hosts and host instances. The fact that we can configure BizTalk hosts and host instances after deployment is really nice because as we need to scale up a BizTalk group, we can redistribute our application components to take advantage of the new hardware. All right, well, let's answer the question, what is a host? A BizTalk host is just one of those things that you could characterize as a configuration object. It contains a list of components, and it also includes a list of server names that can execute that particular list of components. So if you simply created a host and assigned it a list of components and stopped there, those components would never execute because you've never specified where they should execute. You need to define one or more instances of that host, and then that will specify where the components should execute. You define an instance of a host by adding entries to the list of server names configured for that host. So that combination becomes very powerful. Host A is configured with two instances. Host B is configured with three instances. And host C is configured with one instance. And if we find that that is not the best configuration, we can simply reconfigure the list of instances for each host to make better use of our hardware. By the way, a host instance turns out to be an instance of the BizTalk Windows service. So as you create new instances of your hosts, you will see new instances of the BizTalk service show up in the Windows Services console, and each of those will be identified with a unique name. The other nice thing about this model is that you can configure this per BizTalk environment. So perhaps on your own developer workstation, you have all three of these hosts defined, it's not a problem to say that the instances of these hosts all run on the same machine. But then when you do migrate your application to an environment that has multiple servers available, your components can be redistributed accordingly as determined by the hosting configuration for that group. So as I mentioned earlier, it usually falls in the lap of an administrator to make these assignments. But it's a good idea for developers to understand this model. Now for the most part, the details of hosts and host instances are hidden from view. If you visit the admin console and expand the platform settings node, you'll be able to see the relationships between hosts and host instances. When BizTalk is configured for the first time, the default configuration of BizTalk Server is to include one host named BizTalk Server Application, and then to create one instance of that host on the local machine. Now there are a couple of questions that arise when you look at this series of screenshots. First of all, how do we assign a component to a host? Well, you can see in the upper left, we have the BizTalk server application host that is defined and its host instance in the screenshot beneath that. But then if you look at the screenshot in the lower right, one of the configuration settings that you need to apply to an orchestration is the name of its host. In our case, we only have one entry in that list because we only have one host that can support an orchestration in our BizTalk group. If we added that host, we would see more options in that list and we would just need to select the appropriate one. The other question is, what is this BizTalk server isolated host? What does that mean? Well, if you look at the first host, you'll notice that its type is in process. That means that the BizTalk server application host is an instance of the BizTalk service. Sometimes, however, we're going to have hosts that are not instances of the BizTalk Windows service. For example, when we host the HTTP receive adapter in IIS, BizTalk considers IIS to be a host, but since it does not have control over IIS, it needs to treat it a little bit differently. So an isolated host then is an operating system process that is hosting BizTalk components 
but the process itself is not governed by BizTalk. So by defining isolated hosts, BizTalk can maintain the configuration settings that it requires to interact with those hosts. In this lab, you'll get a chance to perform the sequence of steps that is required to deploy an application. And then you get a chance to try out the tools that BizTalk provides to manage that application.